fair warning, uh, this is going to be a little bit interactive, so please try to go ahead and raise your hand if I ask you to. Would be nice. First question, who here is a developer and or a designer? And please keep your hand raised. If the answer is yes. Who does not to be intent uh, to be a developer forever? <coughs> okay, okay, quite a lot of people. Good, good, good. Uh, then who here thinks he or she is ready to lead a team? Nice, nice. Who just likes raising their hand? <laughs> Cool, thank you all. So, my name is Pascal de Fink. Um, I do stuff at Amsterdam PHP. Uh, I uh, was a coach at WeCamp, which is an awesome adventure of, full of coding on an island in the Netherlands. If you want more information for next year, I can recommend it. Please ask me later. I also currently work at TicketSwap, but this story is not about TicketSwap. Before I go ahead and tell my story, can anybody tell me who this is? It is Alexander the Great, indeed. Very good. This guy was 33 years old when he already was the greatest emperor and general that the ancient age knew. He conquered dozens of countries, he led great armies, and he was raised from a, a little boy up to the man that he became through military school and um, uh, army school to, to become that, that great emperor, that leader of men. Now, of course, he had all that privilege. Remember privilege? He had it. I didn't. You probably don't have access to military school from birth either. So the question then becomes, how do you get to be that, that great leader that some of you think you already are, which is, which is great? I learned it on the job. I didn't went to school for it. I learned on the job. And this was basically my path. This is an oversimplification of uh, a couple of uh, career options that most developers know. This slide was not made by me, it was made by Brendan Hayes. He did an excellent talk at RubyCon a couple of years ago about hacking your career. It's on YouTube, and I can really recommend it. But what it shows is that you have junior development, where most people start when they leave uh, the university. And then you have a myriad of options, uh, development evangelist, become a more senior developer, you can start your own company, you become a project leader, all these things that you can do. What a lot of people I know do is they start as a junior developer, they become a mid-developer, senior developer, and then they take a turn to the left. That's what I did, and I became an engineering lead, team lead, lead developer, as it was called in my company back then. Now what you can see here is that it's not a developer role anymore. Right? This is in the management track. And this is interesting because the role was still called lead developer, but it's in the management track. Now this can differ for Com per company. Some de lead developers I know do only that. They lead the development team. They don't do vacation days. They don't do any of the personal things. Just development. That's cool. But just to realize that for companies, it can be in that track. Okay, so my story. At the time, I was working for a small company within a very large company. It was one of the biggest media companies in the Netherlands, which, to be fair, the Netherlands is very small, but still. Um, 
We were in a, a very new development team. This company, although being in existence for 15 years, didn't have a development team of their own. So they formed a development team. I was part of it. Um, but the manager there um, left. OK, that happens, right? So right before Christmas, my boss, she comes up to me. And she says, you know, we think that you would be the ideal person to be the leader of this team, the what we call lead developer. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> Ooh. Came with a good pay raise, of course. Um, and and yeah, sure, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm up for the task. I'll do that. This was a, a team of four other developers next to me. There was a uh, a second line, more technical support team, which was supposed to be merged into that development team. And there, was an, there were two external teams that worked on a remote location. So all in all, this was 12, 13 people. I would start 2nd of January, first was on a Sunday. 2nd of January. And I had, for a week long, like from Christmas to New Year's Eve, no, to New Year's, New, New Year's, sorry. I had all these, these dreams, these hopes, these things that I, I knew I could do. Um, they had a, a huge amount of legacy. I hate that L word, but they had a huge amount of unmaintained code. They were still running on a uh, older PHP version. They were still using a database out of the Stone Ages which required two people to administer. Insane. I had all these things that I thought by myself, like, oh yeah, now is my time, right? My opportunity to change things in here. I'm ready to lead this team to victory. Didn't go so well. <laughs> At all. I had all these, these hopes and all these things that I wanted, but I got so distracted. I got distracted by, by a lot of other things. Things that had nothing to do with upgrading PHP or databases or migrating or legacy. Nothing whatsoever. I did other stuff. And so a couple of months in, I, I started to ask myself the question, why were these tasks so distracting for me? What were these things that took up all of my week, and I couldn't do anything done. Why? I just wasn't prepared. I was not prepared for this job at all. It turned out that the company and I had a very different meaning to what it meant to be a lead developer. They thought this is just going to be a manager type of person, a manager type of person that has intimate knowledge uh, into the code and our code base, so that has all kinds of benefits. Whilst I thought I'm just going to be the one responsible, I'm going to spearhead new ideas. They didn't want that, wanted me to spearhead new ideas at all. At all. <laughs> So my first lesson, the, the thing that I learned and the thing that I want to give you today is expectation management. It is perhaps the most important thing in your career, but especially to me when I transitioned to two, being a lead developer. In fact, I'd say that you should learn what is expected from you and be honest about what you expect from others. Uh, when discussing the possibility even of becoming a leader. You can, you can stand up right now. You can leave if you think I'm boring. Uh, you can fall asleep, you can open Twitter and just sink into your timeline if you want, but please go home with this, this one lesson. Everybody got it? Expectation management, very important. Because I didn't do this. I didn't do this at all, and it led me to not even see the code at all anymore. None of it. Oh, that is not true. 
The only time I did saw code was during a code review, which I did a lot of. Now, spending less time on your code is, of course, logical. You're in a new role. It is a, a leadership role, and, and there is different other um, stuff that you have to do that come to it. But nothing at all, that's, that's too little, I'd say. Um, so if you're ever in, in this kind of position, or if you're in that kind of position right now, try to find ways to get more code time again. People ask me, OK, so what is a, a good uh, sort of um, trade, trade per, per time? What, what, uh, how much percent of time should I dedicate to the code? And I, and I can't answer that. I don't know. It, it depends on the context. It depends on you as a, as a leader. It depends on your company. It depends on your team heavily. But I'd say, personally, my gut feeling would say at least 40% of your time should go to the code. Because it is the output of your team. And being or coding sh doesn't mean just being behind a computer on your own programming. It can be a myriad of things, um, like pair programming and stuff like that, which all help. So make sure you still get enough code time, is basically what I'm trying to say. I figured out three things to cope with this, the fact that I didn't see the code anymore. Three little things that if you hear them, you're probably thinking, what the hell is this guy thinking about? I mean, couldn't you have figured it out in the first day? Seriously? <laughs> but no, I couldn't. And uh, I hope you all could, uh, but if not, take this home. So the first thing was agenda management. Who here uses an agenda? Nobody? Oh, a couple of people. Then uh, who uses it every day? Not a lot of people. <laughs> OK, that's cool, because I didn't do that either. When I was a developer, um, we had the, the sprint planning, the retrospectives, and the daily stand-up. That was it. No more meetings other than that. Plus, my entire team had to go to that meeting room, so I just followed along with them. It was easy. I didn't need an agenda. Of course, I had one for personal stuff, and it was in my phone. But you know, how many appointments do you have? I didn't need it. So I wasn't very good at managing my agenda either. Then the week, the, the same week as I became a late lead developer, so from 2 to 6 of January, my entire agenda was filled for the rest of the year. All these meetings about new projects, products, board meetings, keeping the board in loop, system administrators that wanted to talk to me, uh, project leads, support people that wanted something of me. And they all needed my time, multiple times a week, hours on end, with no agenda for those meetings. So agenda management is something I had to employ. I had to be able to block hours in my agenda to keep them free. No meetings. My entire morning, no meeting. If you're somebody that is more productive in the afternoon, Block your afternoon, do the meetings in the morning. This really helps you to keep that focus, keep that code time as well. Because otherwise it's so hard, other people will just walls over your agenda and it's going to be filled up. Now, this first thing required a second thing of me to say no more often. I don't know about you, but for me, that's hard. It's hard to do. I don't often say no. I like to say yes. I like to help people. If they come up with a problem, I like to say yes. I like to get them moving and, and solve their problems. It's what I do. I'm a problem solver, right? So uh, saying no, that was super hard. 
saying no to a project request. Sorry, I can't do it right now. It was super hard, but I had to learn it. Now, I'm not saying that you should be impolite to people, though. I'm not saying that you should shut them off and shut them down and not interface with them at all. What you can do, though, is give them alternatives. Sorry, I won't be able to make that meeting on Tuesday, but what about next week? I have a slot open there. Sorry, um, I'm probably not the one that can produce that SQL report that you're asking, but there's a database administrator right there. Try him. He may have time. You know, help people on their way. They'll remember you as a polite person. And hopefully they won't ask so much of you anymore, but at least you set no, so you set a boundary for yourself. It's very important. Cool. Agenda management, saying no more often. Okay, this is cool. I got this. There was a third thing, though. Something so easy that I totally forgot about it. Delegating. I'm not alone. I am not the team. There is no I in team. Ha. I found out that every little thing that people asked of me, I took it as a very personal question. I thought I had to do it. I thought I had to fix that bug. I thought I had to implement that feature. I was personally made responsible of it, which of course makes no sense. There's a whole team. There was 12 people for crying out loud. I could do this. I could go up to this team and say, hey, this new feature came in. What do you think? How should we build it? Hey, people, uh, support reported a bug. Who's free? Who can do something for me here? Delegating. And I'm not saying that you should tell people what to do. That's very bossy style. No, it's not my style. But discussing things and delegating them, asking people to help you. People want to help, like I did. For me, the best time was when something came in and I was able to pair up with, for example, a more junior developer, because then I could have the more delegating exercise and I was able to do code time, so it was like a double high five. Seriously, people love to help, especially in a team. Otherwise, they wouldn't be working in a team. Makes sense, right? Okay, three things. Agenda management, saying no more often, delegating. Cool. Did those. And I was still not able to do all the other things that I wanted. Oh my God, what was I doing? Where was my time going? I looked at my agenda, and over time I saw a pattern of things that I was doing other than all those things that I set out to do. For the most part, I was doing a lot of cultural things and culture building things. Now, like I said, this was a very new development team. Um, and it's very hard for new people to come together and, and form a culture. Now I had to form an idea in my head what I wanted that culture to be. This is before I even took this to the team. This was like, okay, what, what, as a leader, what do I want this culture to be in this, in this group of individuals that have come together and be paid to do this job? So I thought of, you know, what are things that I like? Behavioral things that I like in people. Um, I like promoting good ideas, for example. Taking responsibility for your work and your ideas. Those things that I value highly. But there's also a, uh, a saying that the culture of any organization is 
shaped by the worst behavior a leader is willing to tolerate. It's like, oh, okay. Worst behavior, worst behavior. Hmm, what's that? So it got me thinking, what is the behavior I'm not willing to tolerate? People coming in late. Nah, I come in late. People have good reasons to come in late. I don't know. People didn't transfer knowledge. Oh, yeah, I hate it when it happens. I hate it when it happens. And, of course, one day, on a Friday, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, something broke down on the website. Most people went home already. And it was in a new feature that somebody that went home built. And all signs pointed towards the knowledge not being transferred, you know, all this stuff that I was thinking about that I wasn't willing to tolerate. So next week we fixed it, <laughs> barely. We fixed it, and next week when I was calmer, I organized a retrospective, an extra retrospective, I should say, to, you know, discuss why did this happen? What was the, the root cause of it? And I, of course, stupidly thought, I already know what I'm going to hear. I already know the answer. I'm just going to ask it to be polite. I knew that they didn't transfer their knowledge. But they did. Of course they did. They were not stupid. They're professionals. They're paid for it. They're a team. I just had to learn another big lesson, which is trust. Trust in the professionals that you work with. I had to let it go, literally. I had to stop micromanaging. I had to trust these people to do their job they were paid for. And trust is something I also value highly. I like to be trusted. Um, and I learned, thusly, to place more trust into people. So I think that a culture is also shaped by the best behavior a leader is willing to promote. Works both ways. But there was more things to this culture thing. Things that, I, I, that took a lot of time for me. Um, especially because we had quite a number of junior, the ratio between junior people and more senior people was like 50%, which is a lot, especially for a new development team. So it was hard. So one of the things that I took extra amount of time for was um, motive, mentoring, sorry. Mentoring people to reach their goals, the things in their careers and lives that they want to achieve, through work as one of their means. Um, you know, figuring out what you want in your career, what you want to do, what you're not so good in yet, how can I help you with that? Trying to unlock people themselves, trying to unlock their process of thought. That takes a lot of time, but it's so important to do, especially as a leader, because if whether we want it or not, but a lot of young people still look up to older people and leaders. So if you, as a leader, open up and start mentoring, and in return be, are willing and prepared to be mentored a little bit, that opens up a world of possibilities. Giving and receiving feedback is also something that I took a lot of time for. I personally think it is very important for my personal growth to constantly ask for feedback of people. I, do that, I did that back then, I still do it in my current job. Even if there is not an, an official feedback program or anything, or a 360 degrees feedback program is, I believe, what they call it. Even if we don't have that officially, I still created it, and 
I want feedback. Give me feedback. In turn, I would also like to give you feedback in order for you to grow. And again, having a very junior team, that was very important to me. It shapes your culture. Whoa, what happened there? There we go. Motivating is another thing I, I had a lot of issues with. Like I said, we had a lot of legacy. We were working with a database technology from a company I will not mention. You probably guessed it already. And it's not very up to date anymore, especially the version that we were using. So motivation was hard to find. It was hard to find motivation for people to get up in the morning, go to work, work on a feature in that database, and then have joy in their work. Because joy in your work is really important. So we found out that um, by, by trying to motivate each other more, um, you can really find that, that fun spot again. And uh, motivation can be, can be a very uh, interesting thing to see. Uh, it can be like, um, I don't know if, if, if there's anyone here that does boxing, but if you do, there's a punching bag and somebody holds it for you and you start punching it and, and this other person is like, yeah, come on, you can do it. One more punch, harder. Up, up, down, up. This is very motivating. If you've ever experienced that, you know that it, is, it can be a very motivational thing to, to have experienced. Um, and it is roughly the same, I found, in, in a work situation. If there's somebody who says, yeah, we can do this, and this is going to be fun because we're going to do this and this and this, and there's a challenge over here. Come on, let's do it together. That is extremely motivating to people. But it takes a lot of time. It's a huge impact on your culture. I know companies that don't do it, and there are, uh, people just leave after a certain amount of time, and it's just sad to see. Talking about leaving, another big impact on your culture is hiring and firing people. Sadly, I had to fire someone once in my life, and it was one of the worst experiences I ever had, because it's really sad. But equally interesting is hiring people. That's, that's incredibly hard. As Graham told us this morning, uh, it's not just a pipeline thing, it's a culture thing as well. And having it all correct and in order, that is, that is hard, especially as a white male. But the impact on your team is also very interesting because teams are immutable. That means that teams don't change. If you take team A, add two people, it doesn't become team A plus, team plus two people, it becomes team B, which is an entire different team with different cultural values, different insights, different roles, even though they're not explicit. Um, so this is very important to know. And um, as a thought experience, if you are currently in the process of hiring someone or, or uh, you just got a new teammate, watch this process happen in your own team. It's very interesting. Your team becomes a new team. Sickness and other personal problems of people um, are some things that I wanted to handle with grace. So I invested a lot of time in it. I had uh, a coworker that had a baby on the way, which is great. It's great. But as soon as he got the call, come to the hospital, you know, he would drop everything out of his hands, which is fine, of course, go. Here, take my car, go. But we as a team had to talk about, okay, how are we going to resolve it that moment in time 
when he leaves? How are we going to handle the work that he, le that he left us? People getting sick has an equally dent on, on your, or not a dent, but an impact on your culture, especially if uh, the sickness is prolonged for a period of, of weeks or months. If somebody's missing, you can see that the team grows back to another team again, because teams are immutable, take somebody out, it goes good, that goes okay for a couple of days. But after a couple of weeks, this team starts to rearrange their roles. You know, if this, this person was a more natural leader and this person is now gone, another one will stand up like, yeah, but I'm a more natural leader now. You know, there's processes in teams that happen. So it all influences your culture. And the last thing that I found really important was leading by example. All these things up here that were important to me, all these cultural things that I wanted to have, without my team having wanting to have them, or, or you know, just, they were just my values. I, I find, I found it back then, and I still think so, that I had to lead by example. If I wanted to be mentored, I had to start mentoring. If I wanted feedback, I had to give feedback first and ask it. So what I'm trying to say here is I'm more of a, a leader kind of person and, and not, not a boss up there, not caring about the people he has to work with, like, get off, get off my lawn. That's not me. But that might also mean um, that you're much slower to reach the top. Sorry, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Okay, go with culture. Now something different, something entirely different that might or might not be recognizable for you. Financial management. Is there anybody here that owns a company? Quite a couple of people? Yeah, you probably know what I'm talking about here. So, when I wanted a new IDE before, uh, a new license for, uh, we use Jetstorm, JetBrains uh, uh, IDEs at work, I used to go up to my manager uh, or uh, we had an assistant uh, of the director that handled all kind of transactional things with money. But when I became lead developer, my team started to go to me. I don't know, uh, yeah, okay, let's order it. How do we get money? I don't know, let me check. Because even in personal life, I'm not, I'm not very good with money. So let me tell you how, how I handle my money. Money comes in. Some of it goes to a separate account for, you know, all the standard things like rent and insurances, stuff like that. And the rest is basically for me to spend. <laughs> and then there's a little piece at the end of the month that's left. But <laughs> so I'm not very good with money. But businesses don't like it when you manage your, their money like that. They don't like that very well. <laughs> so that day, the boss comes up to me and says, hey, you know that database company that we have hired for six months now? How much did it cost us up to now? And how much more do you want to spend on them? <laughs> Interesting question. Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> now, back then, I didn't have the beard. But if I had, I would be stroking it all day. <laughs> I cleared out my schedule. This was right after lunch. I cleared up my schedule for the entire day. I thought, you know, I'm not the best in Excel and, and in, with accounting, but I can do this. I can do this. I'm a fairly decent programmer. I should be able to do this, right? So I downloaded all the invoices that I had from my mail and, and other places. I didn't have a system. And started typing away in Excel and making formulas and you know, like you do, when you don't know Excel at all. 
I, I, I didn't know what, I, what the hell I was doing, and I, I, I failed miserably. So it was 6 o'clock. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go home, take all these with me, have a nice dinner first, and then I'm re-energized. And in the evening, and if need be, the entire night, I can just do this. So I get home, and uh, luckily my uh, wife already prepared dinner. But I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention. You probably know what that's like, right? Coming home and not paying attention to your wife uh, or, or, or spouse. Um, so she says, you know, what's wrong? You're distracted with something. What's wrong? So I tell her the entire story. And she tells me, you know what? Go sit on the couch. Here's the remote, off the TV, go watch something, give me 30 minutes, and I'll be back with the solution. Whoa, okay. <laughs> nice, nice, cool, yeah, sure, why not? Finally, half an hour uh, of, of not having to think about it, that's good. And she comes up, like, literally 30 minutes later with this. And she says, yeah, you know, all those invoices, just fill them out there, and then uh, over there you can see how much you spend, and over there you can estimate how much you can still... Wow. <laughs> oh, my God, you're a lifesaver. Wow. Now, if you're questioning this story, she's right here, so you can ask. This was one of the hardest things I had to do. One of the hardest things I had to do at that moment. But it thought me, it occurred to me back then that I know that I had managers before, leaders, uh, financial people, that, you know, I'd, I'd seen these things before. Couldn't I have asked them to take a better look at it? Could, could I? Could I have done that? And I guess I could have. I could have learned more from the leaders that I already had. I could have asked them, hey, what's our budget as a dev team? Where are we spending our money on? How do you do that? What's your system? I don't need the exact numbers. I don't care about those. Just teach me here in more than just developer stuff, because I know code already, and you probably don't. So. Teach me what you do now. <laughs> Learn from our previous, current, and future leaders. It's something that I learned back then. Another thing that I used, another skill that I had to use quite often there, was public speaking. So, ta-da, here I am. It is extremely useful to be able to Tell a story about a problem in layman terms. Because the board of directors, they don't know code. Your clients probably don't know it. Support people don't, probably don't know it. And marketing probably don't know it. Know it. Sales does, sure doesn't know it. So being able to explain things in a simpler way can really make your job easier. Uh, for example, I once used this picture to explain the state of our code base. <laughs> True story. And uh, after me telling stories about, you know, why is it so hard to migrate our code base from one hosting provider to the other hosting provider, using this as a metaphor, it, it clicked better with the board that, yes, we needed more money, we needed people, and we needed more time to do this. So being able to explain that saved our team a lot of trouble. Talking to others. And with others, I do not mean other developers or designers or product managers, because I, I knew how to talk to those people. You know, they're my kind of peeps. Marketing, sales, communication people, uh, accountings, controllers, people like that. Those were the hardest ones to talk to, because what do I have in common with them? But it turned out it was very important to be able to talk to them, because marketing was about to launch 
a uh, marketing campaign at prime time that I didn't know about. Holy hell. <laughs> so it was very important to me to, do, to be able to do that, to be able to talk to other people outside of my comfort zone. I had to learn that. I had to find out how to do that. And it turns out that finding common ground with these people is the key to success, sort of. So I had, for example, the luck that I had to do a management training and so did all the other new managers in the company. Uh, one of them was the marketing director. So next Monday, I could ask him, you know, how was your weekend? Um, how, how did you do that exercise as well? And we, ha we found common ground to talk to each other. We connected a little bit more, and it was easier to talk about work after that. These are all the things that I've learned, that I struggled with, that I've probably done wrong, things that I'm probably doing wrong right now. Just the fact that I know what I'm doing wrong doesn't mean I'm not doing it wrong anymore. But if there's one final thing that I've learned, is that it's not about the title. Yes. Uh, my title was lead developer. No, my title isn't lead developer anymore. I'm just a software engineer. But that doesn't mean that I cannot do things, that I cannot take leadership of my own life, my own career, my own work, my own team, the culture in it. So there's a lot of things that you, you if you want to, of course, can do right now, like Monday when you're back. For example, start mentoring. If there's no formal program within your company, start one. You don't need permission to do that. Just take somebody else that feels the same way and go to uh, a meeting room and, and start flushing out how you want to do this. More people will tag along. If nobody's into it, you can always ask others, friends, former colleagues, People in the community, for example, are very good ways of, of mentoring as well. Uh, there is this website called PHP Mentoring. Now, I've, it has been mentioned to me that there should be a dash between PHP and mentoring. This is a website started by a couple of PHP people, but it's not exclusively for PHP. They do mentoring on all sorts of different topics, mostly non-technical either. And you can assign yourself either as a sign up as a, a mentor or a mentee looking for a mentor. Uh, and this is a great way to meet new people, meet new people that have all these other skills that you want to learn. Or if you think, you know, I have a good skill that I can give to other people, sign up there and, and become a mentor. It's something you can do Monday. Ask for help more from your peers, from your current leaders, whoever that may be, like I said, learn from them. Ask them for the, the stuff that you don't know already that you might be able to use later on. I found it very hard, like I said, and this book was gifted to me. It's called The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer, and I can really recommend it. It is a great book. Uh, there's also an audio book, which she has done herself, and it is excellent. Feedback. You can do this on Monday. Just ask somebody, give me feedback. Create a Google forum or talk to each other, whatever you want. Just, you can do this. Public speaking. Again, you can do this. Uh, right here at a, at a conference, for example. But if this audience might be too large for you, you can also do uh, lunch sessions with your own team. Uh, go to your own community. I know there's a, quite a couple of communities around here. <laughs> you know, go there. Speak. They're probably always looking for new speakers. I know in Amsterdam, at Amsterdam PHP, we are. And it is a great 
stage to try out new things, even when you're anxious to speak. And generally, take an interest in other people. Again, something you can do today. Talk to somebody today that you haven't met before. Um, take an interest and maybe you'll learn something. Thank you.